In the PAX Ignition Tournament, T1 got absolutely demolished. And while they were close games, a dark horse in Homeless actually knocked T1 out of the tournament. So let's break down this insane map one, talk about play by play of different things that you should know that you could incorporate in your games. And what big mistakes did T1 make that really put the nail in the coffin here, knocking them out of the tournament? Anyways, before we get started, smash that sub button if you like in-depth pro game breakdowns. Definitely let me know and I can print these videos out like crazy. I love watching pro matches and if y'all like the breakdowns, definitely show your support in the comments down below. Anyways, without further ado, let's just jump right into it, shall we? Now for the first play, we're going to break down actually a play by T1 at the very beginning. And this is pistol round T1 on defense. And T1 throughout the tournament up to this point is probably the god of pistol round with a legitimate over 80% pistol win rate. So let's look into exactly what they do to get the advantage here. Well, before we even get started, look at the mini map here, because this is really important. T1 is legitimately four stacking on B long defense on bind. Now at first glance, you're like, what the heck? They're four stacking on defense on one particular side. Well, I want you to notice a few things. Notice first how their brimstone is playing on A site. Brimstone's one of the best stalls in the game, and as such, they put him on A site alone because he could potentially stall out the enemy. On top of that, they set up a camera, a cipher camera, plus two traps to further help the Brim. The Brim has the trap wires and his own smokes, plus his molly, to potentially stop any sort of pushes, plus they get that constant stream of information from the cam. Now all that is so, in case of a rush push, T1's Brim can still defend himself just in time for the retake. Now before we give you some takeaways about that, let's talk about this engagement by Brax and the rest of T1. While Brax does go in and dies for the sake of info, this unexpected 4 stack long is a risky gamble that pays off huge. And I'm sure that T1 wanted like a 4v2 scenario where they could have capsized on the enemy and used their numbers advantage, but regardless, they used the split tactic to gain an early numbers advantage. Now the important thing here though, is that T1 is not going to let Brax die for free. Some people, and maybe even you yourself, would have backed off after Brax died for essentially free, but the problem with this is that you don't use the information to counter trade an enemy who has no information on you. Now the big takeaway here is, never let your allies die near you for no gain. So the call was made to commit and swing, and T1 managed to trade out for not only Brax's death, but gains enough kills to gain a numbers advantage. Homeless also makes a huge mistake here and lines up, and lets the enemy cipher crashes with only a classic trade them out in a line. Now in hindsight, they probably could have wide swung and made a full commit team fight right after Brax's death. This sort of passivity by Homeless cost them huge here, and in the face of T1's four stack defensive hold, let T1 create an early numbers advantage that will help them for the rest of the round. Now going back to having their brimstone play separate on a point, now keep in mind a big takeaway about Cypher is you do not have to play on the same site that you're putting your utility, you want to constantly be mixing up your utility, as long as your teammates know it's there and can use it or make plays off of it, it can still be very effective, and they actually balanced out the power level by putting all of his utility on the actual site with brim. So now after the trade, T1 has a huge advantage for two reasons. First off, they have double info still left alive, which makes it incredibly difficult for the enemy to make a sneaky play. And all T1 has to do to win this round is to make sure that every kill is traded. So here's the big takeaway. If you're up players, guarding each other's angles is more important than making a play. Always be in a position to protect each other or trade out. Just like in this example, how food avenges Crashy's death versus Somps. And what is interesting actually about that engagement is that Crash is actually engaged in front of Psalms as Psalms was engaging food. You see how Crashy almost ensures his own death, but in the process protects the further away target food who has a much more reliable angle and a much more reliable form of trading after the fact. With a ghost pistol and a much further angle who ultimately picks up the kill on the damaged Psalms through a wall bank. Now before we break down more rounds, let's break down the differences in these two powerhouse teams and their respective team compositions and talk about a key different character that they play on buying. Now first off, there's some textbook things for both teams. 
Double info is the first thing. Cypher is pretty much OP and seeing tons of pick rate no matter what. And Sova is insane on bind with all the rollouts, one of which I'm going to cover later, so make sure you stick around for that. Now, Brimstone is a very reliable smoke, and on top of that, he's a very good staller with Molly, and that's why he's seeing play on both teams. And then Sage is just nuts and OP. We all know how good Sage is. Now, the interesting differentiator is actually Phoenix versus Rays. You know, it seems that the Rays is kind of out of left field. We've seen the Phoenix very often in a very similar team comp, like when TSM's drone plays Phoenix all the time, but the Rays kind of seems a little bit obscure. Now, we're going to break a Rays clip down in a little bit, but Rays is one, almost like the third form of info. With her boom bot, it does an info impression. Her nades interact very positively with callouts and info about pushes, and specifically around the teleporter arm bind. Hookah pushes become very, very difficult versus a raise that is playing a side. Now, I'm going to break down that more later, but keep in mind that this is a very important distinction between the team compositions that you need to take note of. Now, this next clip is actually a clip by T1 again, Skadoodle, who shows us an absolute clinic with trigger discipline. Now, notice how he pushes up and takes this close angle where enemies are unlikely to check during a rotation. Now, this is a powerful position that can catch enemies who are holding the forward angles off guard. He lets the cypher pass, holds in on the player in the back, makes a short burst on the back guy, and then flicks instantly, basically like he programmed it in before he makes the play and gets a double kill. Now, the big takeaway here is that you can be very rewarded by being patient with that trigger discipline, especially when you're hiding in an angle that cuts off rotation. On top of that, you should be killing the back one first before the one in front so the back one isn't in a better position to swing you as opposed to the person in front has to make a legitimate 180. Now the most important thing to ensure that these plays go successful in your games is make sure that that first burst of bullets connects with headshots as it lets you more easily set up the flick plus the second burst on the second enemy. You honestly cannot afford to spend more than a millisecond killing the first guy after you start firing so as long as you take your time and line up that first headshot you're gonna have way more consistent double kill plays. Now, the second big takeaway comes at the cost of homeless. Check your damn angles, man. And I know that a lot of you in the comments always say, Coach Mills, these tips are for like silver players. Well, guess what? A top team who actually beats T1, knocks them out of the entire tournament, didn't check their angles. So I cannot repeat this tip enough. Now, unfortunately for Skadoodle, he assumed that the enemy would rotate when he saw the Sova routing long, but unfortunately, he didn't have the info that there was already a Sage long, which made that far less likely. He was caught slightly off guard, unable to clutch up the round, but still, that double kill was pretty flashy. Now, moving further along in the tournament, Homeless has to basically roll T1, who has a defensive advantage and Skadoodle on Operator. Essentially, there's a lot of things going against them. Now, first off, notice the push by Homeless and their general attacking playstyle that honestly is textbook, but incredibly powerful, and you should try to incorporate it in your scrim or stacked rank games. They have a split B push with one person lurking. Now, the lurking person's important because the Brimstone on Homeless is going to instantly rotate after creating some pressure on A side. While the enemy Cypher on A-side rotates quickly, the Brimstone on A-side defense stays back for quite a bit longer, effectively making the team fight on B better for Homeless, who are effectively fighting 5v4 when they had their Lurker Brimstone create pressure and instantly rotate. The big takeaway here is that simple pressure alone from the Brimstone lurking forced T1 to respect an A push and created a numbers disadvantage scenario for them where their Brimstone didn't rotate fast enough to take an effective 5v5 engagement. Now on top of this, this engagement really showcases the power of Raze. When even Dev got his head clicked off by Skadoodle's opping skills, Raze manages to use a combination of nades plus blast pack to contest and even finish off the enemy operator Skadoodle. Now, everyone always talks about smokes blocking opera sidelines, but on this close side B on bind attack, you can see how Raze can effectively contest operas easily, especially when they're playing mid box. But you could probably roll out paint shells to elbow or CT spawn. Raze is actually very good at contesting ops on this point. Now, imagine a scenario where Def actually lived here. Lasky could have actually just created a numbers advantage outright but at least he traded out for the kill which is very important and something only Ray's probably could have done now after they shut down the mid opera it really gave the allies pushing B long so much free space to take control on site now after that it might seem that Lasky just goes full psycho but because of the isolated angles available only Brax can clean him up who was in a setup position to challenge poised and Som long 
Now after that, Brax wants to make an aggressive play on them, so he flashes both Poised and Psalm and instantly peeks them. Now, this is really crazy what Poised does on Homeless. Watch him instantly hide, he waits for the wall bank spray, and then he peek headshots Brax on an angle while he was still full blind. Yes, you heard me right, he actually peeked while he was blind. Now this requires not only insane crosshair placement, but fundamental understanding of the matchup. Brax also made a vital error making this easier on Poised by not only crouching, but full committing to a wall bank spray, assuming that Poised would never peek blind. Now the big takeaway here is you would be surprised how powerful it is to just spray or even peek an angle while you are blind. Practice doing this against enemies who build up habits of flashing and peeking the exact same corner over and over again. And if you hide and instantly peek after a wall bang or even a millisecond after, enemies will almost never expect you to peek blind. Now after this, you will see poised res in a 1v2 here, and this might seem like a waste, but creating a 3v1 basically 100% secures this round, and if you look at the eco, you notice that one person would have not been able to buy an AR if he didn't res anyways. This was a fine trade that traded them up in eco at worst, and helped them win a potential losing round at best. Now this next round is absolutely mad, and at first, it might seem crazy, but this is 100% something that you should try to incorporate in your games. Notice how T1 is on a save round and they full stack A. And legitimately, they full stack A. Now this is 100% a Hail Mary read. The thing is, on a save round, a split fight will be extremely difficult and the only possible way to win often is to use your numbers and inherent D advantage to trade out. On top of this, Homeless has a habit of going A very often, so this was partially probably due to analyzing Homeless's past games. Now after the Hail Mary did not work, however, and Homeless went the entire other site B, T1 is gonna straight up not even engage. They basically decided that they lost the fight if they made the wrong call, and Homeless went B, so they are gonna give up the round. Now they bet on the wrong horse, and if they thought it was pretty dire before in order to do this play, they definitely know that it's almost impossible to make a play now, now that the enemy has spiked down with their better weapons. Essentially, in order to counteract that, they legitimately camp and spawn, they give Homeless no free kills, and both teams close the round with no deaths. Now, the first big takeaway is that not engaging at all is actually a very common strat for a full team of savers, and they will often choose that option, because you basically have two options. You can make a risky gamble play to try to win a disadvantaged match, or you can just save, not give the enemy any chance to kill you and get that free 1,000 credits throughout their team, and just save all your utility for the next round. Now the next takeaway is make sure that you're ready to kill any stragglers or kill chasers who are trying to contest you savers, but typically pro teams won't chase you down because you're guarding each other's angles, but in ranked play, if someone comes and tries to push you as a team, just stretch your numbers advantage and trade out with them and maybe even take their weapon and upgrade for free. Now really quickly, I know that this is not a Sova guide, but look at this nutty Sova shock dart setup by Psalm. Now, he's in that far right corner on the minimap, and he, he lines it up to the right middle of the telephone wires. It looks like a full charge or near a full one with no bounces. Now, this shock dart damages right out of showers, and I'm sure with slight modifications, it can be made to hit people that are hiding outside of those right boxes as well. So this is actually a very interesting shock dart. Definitely a rollout to remember. Now, moving on to the next part, look closely at the strats that Homeless takes up on defense, and this is where the Sage Rays combo really shines. Poised is Sage in Hookah, and Latsky is playing near Teleporter on A site. This creates so much pressure on Hookah, which is one of the most powerful power angles to contest. Basically, Rays can pressure both mids simultaneously because she could throw pain shells through Telly. On top of that, Poised Sage can really gum them up outside of Hookah, making that 1-2 combo of slow push paint shells all the more deadly. Now in this next incredibly important engagement that we're going to talk about, the enemy T1 decides to rotate mid. Now watch how Lasky insta throws his grenade near boxes the millisecond he gets flashed. Now this is a very powerful strategy that you should incorporate while you use the enemy's own initiation against them. After the flash, they're either going to push in or swing, and either way, the paint shells completely rolls them and either will do a ton of damage or get kills. Now, even after the wall goes up to block his fire, Latsky is still trying to throw his packs over the wall for extra follow-up damage, as often people who are tagged with paint shells will die easily to a blast pack. 
Now, because of these raises strats and just playing raise in general, Homeless actually nets a numbers advantage here, which is really flexing the power of raise on Bind. They couldn't push through Hookah because of Sage plus raise potentially, and now even going through mid A, they're still gonna suffer at the hands of raise. Now, this one pick on Brimstone really opened the door for a dominating stop on defense. Especially Homeless who just came off of a save round after a pistol round 1 loss. This momentum in this round in particular shifts the entire game that was close before and some would even call this the decisive round. Now here's the big takeaway, T1 really messed up here. They generated a fundamental lack of pressure that let raise sandbag paint shells for so long and the failure to not only track paint shells but play around this powerful ability greatly cost them here. Powerful abilities like paint shells really need to be tracked and specifically forced out or else you need to fundamentally play differently around them, like not flash and force rush mid into a raise that still has paint shells. Now a few rounds from now there's another round that is pretty decisive and notice how Latsky holds an operator and catches Brax in this very, very aggressive angle. Now this really speaks volumes to the power of mixing up angles that you hold. Whether it's an aggressive versus defensive position or just mixing up the physical angles that you're actually holding. Now this is not just good at pro play, this could be applied to your ranked games as well and might even be more powerful. Here's the big takeaway, next time you're playing an op in your games, if you're defensive opping an angle and you get a pick there and kill someone, hold a separate angle for the next round. Then maybe a passive angle for the third round and then back to the first angle for the fourth round. Essentially what you're doing is you're cycling through all these angles, always keeping the enemy guessing because that will either make them play like frightened babies or you'll pick up kills for free because they never know what to expect just like how Brax didn't expect Latsky to be playing Shower's defense with an op that close. Now let's break down this last engagement we're going to talk about and at this point I think Homeless has the straight up full read on T1. They actually full stack B on defense when both teams are full by and not only that but T1 decides to go aggressive for the first non-pistol round in the entire game and gets absolutely annihilated by the waiting four stack team of Homeless on the B site. Now let me ask you this question T1, what's the point of playing a double info comp if you're gonna gather no info and just smash W key into a waiting four players? Now if any of you watching know that answer for me, definitely let me know in the comments down below. Now what's a big takeaway from this match? Well it seems that T1 is actually struggling to find a balance. Unlike Homeless who has powerful mix up strategies, 4-1 stack positioning and powerful rage sage combos, T1 doesn't know when to be aggressive versus defensive and a lot of times they're too passive and sometimes they're way too aggressive like in this example. Now this match is going to end 13-10 with the Dark Horse Homeless winning and snowballing not only this map win but onto another win on Ascent, 2 0 T1 and knocking them out of the entire tournament. Now this is a pretty sad result for T1, they made some insane plays but there are still some fun fundamental kinks they are messing up that they need to iron out if they want to become one of the best teams in the world. On top of this, Homeless really impressed me here from a strat based perspective. Whoever their coach is behind the scenes, you are a mad lad because I loved all the strats they incorporated throughout this series and now I'm a Homeless fan for life. Anyways, if you liked this breakdown, smash that like and subscribe button. These honestly take a ton of work, but they're 100% worth it if the Game Leap community loves them. So show your support in the comments down below and by annihilating that like button just like T1 got annihilated. Anyways, that's all I got for you today. Thanks for coming by. I'm Coach Mills and until next time.